Welcome to Deeper Space, a weekly podcast that takes you behind the scenes and deeper down the rabbit hole of Gaia's original series, Deep Space. Together, we uncover the mysteries of the secret space program and share the facts which tell the stories not yet told in the mainstream. This podcast takes a conversation behind the scenes to meet with guests, producers, and passionate advocates from the show, Deep Space. Join the conversation and be a part of the weekly episodes found only on Gaia.com. G-A-I-A dot com. Thanks for tuning in to our post-show exploration of deep space. This is Melissa. We are on with Linda Moulton Howe. She's an Emmy Award winning investigative journalist who has been working in the fields of science and real X-Files for decades. Thanks for joining us, Linda. Well, thank you, Melissa. I'm glad to be here with Gaia. Is there anything you want to say about some of the experiences that you've had or some of the stories that you've covered or even uh, your Earth Files website, if you want to tell our audience a little bit more about that? My entire background has always been focused on science, the environment, medicine, and the real X-Files. From my point of view, today looking back, nothing ever changed in my beat of science, medicine, and the environment. It was always the same and is to this day. But what happened when I was hired to be director of special projects at the CBS station in Denver, my beat was still science, medicine, and the environment, but there were big headlines about who or what was killing and mutilating all these animals in Colorado, the surrounding region in Canada, with the same uh, pattern of excisions. And I wanted to get to the bottom of it. So I started calling sheriffs and calling universities and uh, talking with ranchers and found myself literally going through from what we'll call the normal world into a world where the true reality is that our government has known since World War II about an alien presence on this Earth through the solar system and in the Milky Way galaxy and have had strict policies of denial and the animal mutilations are a part of that interaction by an alien presence that uh, uses Earth. And that's really interesting you mentioned that because uh, in episode two, you specifically say that some of these creatures were uh, from Zeta Reticuli 1 and Zeta Reticuli 2. What's the important part for researchers or for people to pick up for that? Where that began was in 1961 with the first publicly known and described and broadcast human abduction with Betty and Barney Hill in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Uh, That is probably the single most well-known human abduction case on record. This was a case in which a husband and wife, driving back to their home in Massachusetts, were in the White Mountains at night when they both saw a bright light and the husband driving pulled the car over to the side of the road, and from that point on, the two people entered in what we would call a distortion of reality. They lost uh, two or three hours of time, and each eventually would be hypnotized by Benjamin Simon, a very well-respected psychiatrist in Boston, who took a couple of years to interview uh, to do hypnosis and interview them separately so they would not be contaminating each other. And it was in the work with Betty specifically that she remembered vividly seeing a three-dimensional holographic star map inside of what appeared to be a craft that there were beings there that were not human. She described them as being gray, that the leader wore some sort of a strange hat and jacket. And he showed her that here was a three-dimensional star map of our section in this arm of the Milky Way galaxy, where there were several similar yellow suns like ours, and that communicated to her that they were from between two areas in this star map. And when she asked, where is it? And he said, do you know where you are on this map? And she said, no, 
I'm not an astronomer. And he said, if you don't know where you are on this map, how can I tell you? Well, that led, after all of this investigation, to uh, a, an amateur astronomer named Marjorie Fish, who became so fascinated with the fact that Betty Hill, under hypnosis, could draw a very detailed map that was representative of what she had been shown by this being during this missing time. Marjorie Fish spent a great deal of time to try to do a three-dimensional reconstruction of our portion of the Milky Way galaxy that we're in and going out not more than 50 light years. And when this three-dimensional model that she constructed was compared to what astronomers were learning about the stars around us between 1961 and 1980s, there was a match. There was a match of the two large bodies with lots of lines between them and the surrounding star system, and it matched Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2, which is a double binary star system, approximately 39 light years from Earth. And what is especially interesting is that today, what astronomers did not understand back in 1961 during the missing time of Betty and Barney Hill, and they do today, is that Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2 are very similar suns to our yellow sun, but they are still called a binary star system. And and do you believe that these gray beans were actually genetically created by even a higher source that other people have talked about, and that they just come here to maybe do these animal mutilations and, and maybe take genetic samples from human beings like this story? Do you, have you found anything in your research that these are kind of like worker bees, if you will, to like a higher, even a higher dimension being. It's extremely complex. You're referencing the Ronald Reagan presidential briefing paper that was presented to him by the director of the CIA. And I just want everybody to know that's listening. That's going to be in the final episodes of this series. But you can go ahead and tell us. Well, that, <laughs> that was a briefing inserted in what is called the serpo.org material over the last four or five years. And I have talked with a very uh, credible and reliable source in Washington, D.C. about the Ronald Reagan briefing included in that Serpo material, and I have been told without question that is real, it happened. The director of the Central Intelligence Agency, William Casey, a friend of Reagan's, broke down what our government described as five different types of extraterrestrial biological entities, starting with the extraterrestrial biological entities, or even as being the, the prime intelligence, gray, reptilian type, that made the next two on the list. And the next two on the list were the archaloids that had big noses, vertical pupils, reptilian eyes, that may be the type exactly that Betty and Barney Hill were dealing with in New Hampshire. The third on the list was a praying mantis lizard combination that was described as doing a lot of planetary seeding. The fourth were called the heploids. No description, not a single description, was given in the briefing to Ronald Reagan, but my assumption is they are the tall tails the common variety of different forms that may be enemies of the various gray types. And the fifth on the list was something called a trontoloid that the intelligence handler uh, for the president said, these are nasty insects that can camouflage themselves on Earth as blonde-looking humans. And that the, the fifth was the one described as dangerous a thousand years in advance of anything that humans could even conceive on Earth. And that was the great danger because something that was that advanced, that capable, and yet an enemy of the uh, Earth human and these other four was something that our government had to be concerned about. 
I had interviewed you about uh, Iapetus, the moon of Saturn. And from your interview, uh, you kind of broke down this, this humongous wall that's surrounding the planet. And um, you thought maybe this was the first evidence of alien architecture in our universe. Do you believe that some of these groups that you're talking about might be inhabiting Iapetus? I would say when I did the first earthfiles.com reports about Iapetus back in February of 2005, that is when we were getting our first NASA images that were detailed enough for astronomers and planetary geologists to say that here this thing that looks a bit like a walnut out there that nobody had ever seen details on it before then, and it has this equator bulge or line going around, it's, I'm reading from my own report, 12 miles wide, 800 miles long, and 8 miles high in some places. This huge division. Some astronomers will try to argue that there must have been some geophysical forces that pushed the two uh, hemispheres of Iapetus together, like the Himalayas on Earth, and raised this up. However, there are many others that uh, people who are, have not gone on the record but do work professionally in astronomy and physics, and they say they have no idea what the physical mechanism would be that could make such a clear and thin and very defined demarcation between the two hemispheres of Iapetus, but it gets even stranger. The wall runs right through the dark half of Iapetus. On the other half of Iapetus, where there is not such a wall, it is bright white. And so, like a yin and yang, the entire moon of Saturn is dark on one side, light on the other, and on the dark side, here is this eight-mile-high wall that nobody has an explanation for. What happened? Well... Could this be engineering by extraterrestrials is what you are asking. And Correct. The, the only answer I can give as an investigative reporter who likes facts and tries to stick with science is nobody knows. Literally nobody knows. And if they do, they have not made it public. But this is now, as I said, almost boring compared to Ceres, the dwarf planet between uh, the asteroid belt and Mars and Jupiter, where there is a four-mile-high mountain with grooves on the side all the way around, the way we would look at uh, mining operations on Earth. And right next to the four-mile-high mountain on Ceres is a huge crater that even the director of the Ceres uh, flyby, I did two interviews with him, Dr. Raymond, and he himself, to my question, Dr. Raymond, that big crater next to that four-mile-high mountain on Ceres looks like you could tip up the mountain on uh, the four-mile mountain and stick it into that crater, and it would fit. And he said on the record, and it was broadcast, yes, I thought the same thing when I saw it. And then when I say, is it possible there could be terraforming going on on Ceres by something that is of a different intelligence, that's when nobody will talk. So leave mm -hmm. that as a question mark. But then when you come to the work that, is, that John Brandenburg, a plasma physicist, has been doing on Mars, it seems to me that the presence of other intelligences in this solar system from long before there was any standing up primate on Earth is coming into focus more tightly than ever before. And that is John Brandenburg, he's not the only one, but he's the one who has done the most work presenting in a book called Death on Mars that came out a year ago. Yes, and that's definitely in our show. It's, it's, it's yeah. fascinating. Do you actually believe that, uh, do you believe what he's saying, that there, there could have been a nuclear warfare destruction of that, uh, that nearby planet and that this, the residue is actually on Mars? Do you believe he in what he's saying? He is my lead half hour on the August 26th Coast to Coast AM. I do three hours in the last Thursday of every month on Coast to Coast. 
And he's my first half hour because it's now in the category of news. Uh, John Brandenburg has been asked to present a formal paper at the major September 13th to 16th NASA JPL. Uh, it's the International wow, Aeronautics and Astronautics Conference. John has been formally asked to present all of this data and the interview that I will have on Coast to Coast on August 26th is nothing but the facts. And when you compare the data that he's being asked to present and you look at the signatures in Xenon 129, 2.5 times greater inert gas in the atmosphere of Mars than on Earth, where we know for a fact there was no high level of xenon-129 until after 1945. We have uh, information on the atmosphere data of Earth before 1945. It does not match at all post-1945. And we dropped first the atomic test in the um, Trinity site in southern New Mexico at White Sands, and then uh, two and a half weeks later, uh, we were dropping the two bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in Japan, and then between 1945 and the 1960s, there were atomic bombs and hydrogen bomb tests all over this planet. Mm -hmm. Mars' level of xenon-129 is 2.5 times the amount on Earth in which we know that the reason Xenon-129 is on Earth is only from the explosions of these nuclear and atomic and hydrogen bombs. Further, you don't have Argon-40 or Krypton in presence with Xenon-129 unless there has been uh, usually a hydrogen bomb explosion. Mm -hmm. And the Trinitite that has now been confirmed in two sites in the northern hemisphere of Mars at Cydonia Mensa and Galaxis Chaos. Those are the names given. That's, I'm not making them up. Those are the names on the maps that NASA and JPL have put together. Uh, they are not that far apart. Uh, if you look on uh, the uh, look, look on a Mars map that Google does today, and you will see that. Uh, the Arabia Planitia is a big area, and to the right is uh, you can find in finer detail the Cydonia region and the Chaos region. And both of those have glassy surfaces that uh, have been identified as trinitite. On Earth, the only place where green glass trinitite have been confirmed are at the Trinity site at White Sands, where we dropped the atomic bomb test in July of 1945, and in an area in Pakistan, which goes back in time uh, very long ago, which has always puzzled people, and in an area of the Sahara Desert. And that uh, Trinitite glassy material in which there are those three areas on the Earth, one of which we know why it is there is where we dropped the atomic bomb test uh, do you, uh, in uh, Linda, July Do you 45. feel that this information on Mars uh, it, it kind of kind of changes the way that we start thinking about because if, if we if this is true if, if NASA and JPL are like wow this really happened that would mean that that uh, our, if there was such a thing as a progenitor race had created the atomic bomb, it happened before, we're repeating the same pattern, and by us knowing this, we are able to stop the pattern. Do you think that that's the ultimate outcome of the knowledge of, of knowing this kind of information? It's a good question. Chris Hardy who is uh, a researcher and writer now based in France, asked me to uh, review her, it's called uh, The Wars of the Anunnaki that came out about three months ago. And when I closed the last page of that book, which contains an entire section on the evidence, both from the... Uh, the uh, Aramaic and the material, the cuneiform, uh, 
from uh, the Sumerian Mesopotamian age. He's picked up where Zechariah Sitchin left off. It is a description of weapons that were being used between the two brothers, Enlil and Enki, that could only be described as atomic bombs. Mm -hmm. And her subtitle, in fact, is the, uh, the fact of nuclear war in Mesopotamia. And she also ties a link between the Anunnaki presence on Earth and Mars, that simultaneously they were managing both planets at a period of time, which goes way back. Uh, we're talking a, a long time ago before uh, so-called uh, Homo erectus began standing right, up Right, and that in makes Africa. sense with, with some of the things, yeah, with Africa, with the gold mines, and, and there's evidence of, of mining on Mars, and that would, that would completely make sense. And if you take and you go backwards in time, you say, what is the timeline here, John? And they, he'll say, I think it's, this is John's answer. He says, I think it's a half a billion years ago. And it would explain where the water on Mars went. It would, might explain why the two hemispheres don't fit together correctly. Uh, it would explain all the physical evidence and the atmospheric evidence. But he said, uh, in answer to another question, when I said, well, Anthony Sanchez has had a book out since 2010 called UFO Highway that allegedly is a 72-hour download from a U.S. Air Force colonel who gave the information about his work at Dulce Base and then disappeared. Uh, and in that, he says, there was a war, a nuclear war, on Mars one million years ago between tall tails and greys who hate each other and have warred since Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2, uh, a long, uh, millions of years, I guess you would say, ago, and that these wars have been raging between Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2 and our part of the solar system and many other places, and that you feel depressed because I think I and others have always hoped that the tribal warfare of humanity on Earth was because we were babies and that if we got out into the universe and finally made contact with other life, that we would learn that you can't become advanced life uh, and still war, and that therefore the universe must be peaceful and wonderful and great, when in fact every single whistleblower speaking now in the last year or two is that there are warring factions, not only in the Milky Way, but going beyond the Milky Way galaxy. Earth is only a reflection of what is going on in our own cosmos from one and, end And to we the can other. actually change that by understanding and knowing what's going on out there. I mean... Uh, sometimes I think people watch these episodes or get into this stuff and they get into such a negative space of which they feel uh, like they're being controlled by things that are bigger than them when I think the human capacity to understand actually propels us into a deeper consciousness that actually uh, protects us uh, from even entities that are highly more advanced than us. I would say that I agree completely because in this last 37 years of my professional life, the one thing I do know that has grown in its strength for me is that I am convinced that the physics of the, we'll say, the large cosmos with a capital C is a divine field that has no entropy. There is no energy winding down. It is alpha to the omega it is an eternal state in which there is no war or death, but it is responsible for the creation of the matter worlds, probably as training grounds for the cycling of souls, and that the souls, those are the, the that's what the whole relationship between the matter worlds and the divine field is through the souls that the souls grow, evolve, develop, and choose to recycle back to the divine field, and that's the whole point. And therefore, alive, we have tremendous challenges in which one of the fundamental rules that I think is always there, do not be afraid of anything. Always keep going forward with a sense that there is a 
true ally in the divine field. And if you keep going with an open heart and an open mind, your soul will grow. And as your soul grows, no matter what the mystery, no matter what the challenge, no matter even what the evil, because there is evil in this universe, no matter what the dark, black evil is that confronts you, you don't back away. You keep going with the goal that we are meant to explore. So great to have you for this podcast, and I know we're going to have you back for uh, some more Gaia stuff coming up, which I can't disclose right now. Um, okay. So, shh, quiet, don't tell anybody yet. Um, right. But thanks again for being here, Linda. You can find out more information and breaking news on Linda's site, earthfiles.com. Uh, don't forget to continue the conversation with us next week when we look at the impact of German flying saucers in the secret space program. <laughs>